What's up, the Nellon High School? This is Mr. Aiden, and we are in 5.1. That is Solutions, Solutions, 5.1. And this is a great um, carryover from our previous chapter. Here we're taking a look at it, something like ethanol. What does ethanol look like in a... In a uh, in a pure substance, well, ethanol has hydrogen bonding. That oxygen of the OH is going to attract, not not really bond, but attract. That's what hydrogen bonding attractions is. We're talking about intermolecular attractions. And, of course, ethanol, it will attract another ethanol, which will attract another ethanol, and so on and so forth. And so anytime we're trying to boil that guy, we got to go, we got to overcome or heat up and the energy goes into breaking the attractions, the intermolecular attractions. So what happens when we make a solution is the CH3, CH2OH, the ethanol, is dissolved in water. And what happens with the water is the water provides also hydrogen bonding attractions. Okay, Those attractions will rip apart those ethanol molecules and make it totally dissolved. And that's what a solution is. And of course we can say that something like an ionic compound like salt here what happens with salt is when it goes inside water the sodium chloride which was in a lattice type shape a crystalline solid with strong intermolecular attractions ionic attractions it dissociates into a positive ion that's a sodium ion and a negative ion the green chloride ion and you can see what happens here is the oxygen or the negatively charged oxygen polar side of the water will surround and rip apart that sodium ion, that Na+. And the hydrogen side of the water will rip apart the chloride, the Cl-. And that's what happens in any one of our solutions. And so anytime we talk about solubility, the similar attractions will increase the amount of solubility. So hydrogen bonding attracts things that are hydrogen bonding with strong attractions. And in the same way, London dispersion forces attract similar things with London dispersion forces. So we could say that water, because it's hydrogen bonding, things that have hydrogen bonding will be very soluble in water. Whereas things that are nonpolar, like um, like methane or um, oil, things like that, they're going to be very attracted and be very soluble in things like benzene, C6H6, okay? But not in something like water, okay? Also, how do we get solids or liquids dissolved? We've got four things. We want to increase the kinetic energy, either put in some heat, or we want to uh, stir it around or agitate it. We could increase the number of surface areas. That's a fancy term for crushing it down. Um, we could increase the amount of solvent, put more water in it, okay? Or we could add a catalyst. How do we get a gas more dissolved in water? Just think of soda. Anytime you want to think of a gas or like carbon dioxide dissolved in water, what do we want to do? We want to lower the temperature, make those attractions greater, and we want to higher the pressure. We want to keep it confined in one space. And you can see, um, if you let go of that pressure, that gas is going to get out and right up your nose, just like that guy. This brings us to a thing called the Van Hoft factor. Okay, the Van Hoft factor is this little symbol I, and it's a fancy term for the number of particles in the solution. What I want to do quick is go right to a, a simulation here. I, I want to show you what happens when I put salt in water. Okay, what's going to happen with salt in water is it's going to dissociate. And you can see what happens if I put a conductivity meter and the more and more and more salt I have, what happens to the light bulb or the conducting the electricity? It is going to be very, very, very bright. But if I if I do this with sugar, okay, and I put in a conductivity meter and I put sugar in and I put tons and tons and tons and tons of sugar in, sugar doesn't conduct any electricity. It doesn't matter if I put in the exact same amount, it doesn't conduct the electricity. So I want to show you what's actually going on molecularly. Watch what happens with the sodium chloride. It dissociates into positive and negative ions, which conduct electricity. But if I reset it and I take a look at sucrose, which is sugar, my sucrose just breaks up into smaller sucroses, smaller C12, C12, H22O11s. Okay. Um, let's take a look even more molecularly, and I want to take a look at if I put some salt in my water here, and you can take a look, and I'm going to pause it right away. I'm going to pause it. Look at what happened. Immediately, the 
oxygen, the red oxygen, surrounded the Na pluses, and the white hydrogens just surrounded the chloride negatives, and it basically just dissociated, and it went from one particle to two particles, okay? One sodium chloride to two, two particles, one Na plus, one Cl minus. And I, I want to show you exact different what happens with sugar. Here I have two sugar molecules, and watch what happens. It didn't break up, did it? It just broke up, and I still have two particles. I started with two particles. I end up with two particles. There's a one-to-one -one ratio there, and so it didn't dissociate any of it. It's still one big covalently bonded molecule. So let, that brings us back to the, the Van Hoff factor. If I have one C6H12O6, how many particles did that break up into? One. Its Van Hoff factor is one. One particle in my solution. If I have an ionic compound like KCl, how many particles does that break up into? Two. So its Van Hoff factor is two particles. Something like sodium carbonate, how many particles would that break up into? Three particles. Two sodium ions, that's Na+, plus, Na+, plus, and one carbonate ion. How many particles will C3PO42 break up into? Five particles. Three calcium ions, three C plus twos, two of my phosphate ions. That's called a Van Hoff factor. Okay? Let's take a look at some uh, some calculations that we could make with concentration. Our first is molarity. We should be kind of familiar with this. Molarity is moles divided by liters, and we know how to get the moles. It's when, when we have our mass, we divide by our molar mass. That That's our numerator. We're going to divide by liters, and that's going to give us our molarity. Remember, if you see molarity and volume, usually there's an of between it. It'll say 20, 200 milliliters of 0.2 molar. Of means multiply. When we multiply molarity times volume, that gives us moles, of course. And that way we can do any dilution using M1V1 equals M2V2. That's when the moles are equal to my moles. We also have uh, two other calculations, one little one called molality. Molality is moles of solute divided by kilograms of the solvent. So different from molarity, which was moles per liter, this is moles per kilogram. And of course, mole fraction, it will just be a fraction. The partial moles over the total moles. Moles over total moles. Pretty easy. Guys, hope 5.1 helped, and I will see you guys in class. Make sure you can split things up into particles and figure out how many particles there are, and make sure you can draw those molecular and particle drawings. Thanks, guys. Bye.